Okay, welcome class to Physics 390, um, class number eight. This class is on Hilbert space and we'll be looking at some general properties of operators and the physical observables they represent. Um, as in the discrete case and the continuous case where we have a discrete set of um, quantities that the physical observable can take on and where we have a continuous case. So this will be chapters 3.1 to 3.3 of our textbook. Okay, so let's think about wave functions and operators. We've already thought about this in several cases, the infinite square well, the um, harmonic oscillator, um, the uh, free particle um, potential. So um, in general, the quantum state of a system is represented by its wave function psi, okay? That's like the size of the infinite square well, which are the sine functions as we um, go up. So those are the quantum states of a system. Um, physical observables are represented by operators. So for example, X, the position, P, the momentum, H, the total energy. And um, you've calculated expectation values of using the wave functions and the physical observables um, uh, to get the um, expected values of those quantities. So um, what we're gonna do now is cast this in a, a little bit more general mathematical um, format. And to do that, we need to define something called the Hilbert space, um, the title of this uh, video. So the set of all square integrable functions on a specified interval, a, b, that is um, all functions f such that the integral from a to b of the square of the function is finite, less than, less than infinity. That's what it means to be square integral. This is called the Hilbert space. Well, it's called the Hilbert space by physicists. Uh, mathematicians actually call it um, L2AB, but um, with all due respect to mathematicians, we'll, we'll keep calling it Hilbert space in this class. So um, since wave functions must be normalizable, that is they're the integral from say A to B of uh, the wave function squared is equal to one, that's certainly less than infinity, it's certainly finite. So the wave functions, the normalized wave functions form a part of Hilbert space. Hilbert space includes all um, possible values for the normalization integral. Um, the wave functions, the physical wave functions would only have value one. But anyway, the wave functions sit in part of this Hilbert space of square in integrable functions. Okay, <clears throat> now we introduce a very useful notation, which will a, a nice notation which will abbreviate and make um, some of our work a lot uh, cleaner without so many long, long and drawn out integrals. Um, so we define the inner product of two functions as this left bracket F um, vertical bar G right bracket, that's the inner product, is defined as the integral from uh, to the two limits, the relevant limits A and B here, of the left function complex conjugate times the right function G dx. Okay, so the inner, inner product is defined as this integral of the complex conjugate times G dx. And um, this may remind you right away of this form here may remind you of a normalization integral, um, except that we have different functions here. Um, if, if both F and G were, if, if G were equal to F, this would be the integral from A to B of F star F, which would be the same as the normalization integral. So that's kind of what motivates it. Um, <clears throat> and we have the guarantee. This is the reason we work in Hilbert space. Um, if two functions are in Hilbert space, the inner product as defined here will be finite. So in other words, if the two functions f and g are both square integrable, each individually, then they're, they're, the, the integral of f star g will be finite as well. And that's, uh, there's a proof of that in the text. Um, okay, so let's see why this notation could be useful for us. 
Um, so I just we just hinted at this a minute ago. We can say that a wave function f is normalized if the inner product of f with itself is one, because that would imply that the integral from a to b of f star f is equal to one, which is our normalization integral. So it's a very nice little handy notation to write for normalization, a lot more compact. Um, we can say that two wave functions are orthogonal if f and g are orthogonal if the inner product of f and g uh, is equal to, uh, this should say zero actually, not one. Um, so if they're orthogonal, if fg is equal to uh, zero, not one. Um, we can talk about an orthonormal set of functions, fn, so a, a set of functions, and they would be orthonormal if the inner product of fm, fm, fn uh, is equal to delta mn. Okay, so um, so they would be orthonormal if f m f n is equal to delta m n. So if m is equal to n, they would be uh, um, normalized. If m is not equal to n, they would be orthogonal. Okay, um, so that's a very handy notation. We can also look at a complete set um, of functions f n. A complete set means for any function f in the Hilbert space, f can be written as a, uh, a sum over uh, a weighted sum of the um, functions in the set fn, okay? And this may remind you of how we built up, uh, uh, this may remind you of a Fourier series um, where we take a bunch of uh, functions, build them up with, um, uh, specific weights and we can form any um, function in a limited interval from that from that set uh, of functions. So um, then we can say that if these fn in the complete set are also orthonormal, then it turns out that we can calculate cn as the inner product of uh, fn with f, okay? So that would be the, according to this notation, that's called Fourier's trick. And we've used that, uh, we've seen that before. Um, that would be the integral from A to B of <clears throat> Fn of X star F of X dx. So that would be this, that, that would pick out um, by the ortho orthonormality that would pick out the coefficient Cn um, when we do that, that particular integral. Okay, so the um, point is that this notation with these, this inner product Makes our um, makes some of our formulas much more compact and uh, much more general and flexible. Okay, let's talk about um, operators and uh, a specific type of operators called a Hermitian operator, as well as uh, eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, which um, you may remember from linear algebra. Okay, and they they there's a connection to uh, linear algebra here. So um, <clears throat> first let's note that expectation values can be written very nicely in our new notation as well. So the expectation value of Q, the physical quantity Q would be integral psi star Q hat psi dx. That can be written as the inner product of psi with Q hat psi. Um, that's what the inner product means is to integrate the, the left, um, the left part of the inner product with, as the complex conjugate times the right part by itself. Okay, so this is a compact notation for the expectation value. However, here we know that Q is real, uh, that is the expectation value of Q is real because it's a physical quantity like energy or momentum or position. And we expect real numbers there. What would it mean to have a complex position? Um, just doesn't make sense. So, um, so if it's real, that means the expectation value of Q would be equal to the complex conjugate of Q. That's a way of saying that Q is real. If a number is equal to its own complex conjugate, it must be a real number. And that implies um, if Q is equal to Q complex conjugate, then what we're, if you look at this integral here, what we'd be doing is we'd be taking the complex conjugate. So we would have 
um, integral of psi take away this q psi star. But that's the same as the integral of q psi star times psi, which would be um, which would be written in terms of the bracket notation as left bracket q psi um, right bracket psi because this would be the complex conjugate um, q psi star since it's on the left. So um, since this is real, the, what we wrote before for the um, expectation value must be equal to what we get if we take the complex conjugate, which would be this here. And this property that an operator can be, um, is that we get the same thing if the operator operates on the right uh, uh, part of the inner product or the left part of the inner product is called uh, a Hermitian operator. So this defines a Hermitian operator, that if we can switch the, the operator from the right side of the inner product to the left side, and we get the same value. And um, all physical observables are, are represented by Hermitian operators. And incidentally, this is the same Hermit um, who came up with the Hermit polynomials from the harmonic oscillator, um, just in case you're a history buff. Um, Anyway, we can show explicitly that um, momentum is Hermitian and as an operator. So let's take the uh, inner product of uh, a function f with uh, the function, um, the operator p acting on a function g. So expanding that out in terms of integrals, as we do for the definition of the inner product, that'd be the integral from, in this case, from minus infinity to infinity since for momentum can go from minus infinity to infinity of, uh, since this F is on the left, it would be F star times minus I H bar DG DX, since the momentum operator is minus I H bar DDX. So to proceed, we can integrate this by parts, um, taking this as our differential. So we get uh, minus I H bar F star G evaluated between these two limits, that goes to zero because if these functions are uh, going to be normalizable at the limits infinity and minus infinity, they have to go to zero. So this would be um, zero minus zero or zero. And this part here, we would take the derivative of the left part here and the uh, times the integral of the right part here, which would be uh, minus i h bar d f d x star g d x, but that's what we mean by the momentum operator <clears throat> acting on f complex conjugate, um, which would be p f on the left, which is complex conjugate, times g on the right or um, inner product with g on the right. So we have uh, we've we've shown for two functions f and g that if we take f uh, inner product with PG, we get the same thing as um, PF inner product with G. So we can move P from the right side where it acts on G to the left side where it acts on F, and we still get the same value. And that's the, that's the, the Hermitian nature of the operator. Uh, only Hermitian operators have that property. We can switch, switch the um, operator from one side of the inner product to the other and we get the same value. Okay, so, um, so what does this have to do with eigenfunctions and eigenvalues? Well, one thing we're interested in is determinate states um, for an observable Q, like the energy or the position or so forth, or the momentum. Um, so determinate state always give the same value Q, uh, little Q. So every time we measure the state, the determinate state, for the observable Q, we get the same value again and again and again, okay? That's not always the case, but in for certain states, for certain observables, it is the case. So what will we need to see that? Well, we would need the variance of, of Q uh, to be zero, because uh, which implies the standard deviation of Q is zero, which implies we get the same value again and again. So the variance would be defined defined as the um, expectation value of uh, the quantity Q minus the average value of Q, 
squared. That's the definition of the variance. We can plug in um, for the, uh, <clears throat> um, to evaluate this expectation value, we can write it as an inner product. We replace the average of Q with little q because we always get the same value q. So the average has to be that same value q. Um, and we replace uh, the observable q with the operator q in our inner product. So we get psi um, operator q minus little q squared psi inner product. Now we use the fact that this is a, a physical observable. So um, Q minus Q hat minus Q is Hermitian. So we can take one of these factors of the Q minus Q squared, move it over to the left side, and we get um, Q minus Q psi on the left side, Q minus Q psi on the right side. So here's where we use the fact that we're using a um, physical observable. So we have a Hermitian operator. So we switch one of these Q hat minus Qs over to the left side. And now we have a um, inner product of a function with itself equaling zero. And the only way that can happen that the, the, uh, the integral of a function squared is zero is if the function is uniformly zero. So this last equality can only be true if um, Q minus Q psi is equal to zero, okay? So the func that is the, the function itself, or the, the um, yeah, the function itself is zero. But rewriting this a little bit, um, just operating, uh, saying Q psi minus, Q hat psi minus lowercase Q psi is equal to zero, and then bringing the lowercase Q psi to the right side, we get the following equation. Um, Q hat psi is equal to Q psi. Uh, lowercase q psi. And this is called um, an eigenvalue equation for q. So it, it may be sort of familiar from linear algebra where you have a matrix times a vector is equal to a number times that vector back again. Um, here we have an operator times a, uh, a wave function is equal to a number times the wave function back again. So it's still called an eigenvalue equation for the, for the operator q. And <clears throat> psi is called an eigenfunction uh, as opposed to an eigenvector. It's called an eigenfunction now, since this is a wave function. But the, the, the lowercase q is still called an eigenvalue. OK, so, um, so we can conclude then that determinate states of q, the observable q, are eigenfunctions of q hat. Um, they obey this equation here, this uh, Q hat psi is equal to Q psi. So this, if a state psi gives this result, when Q is operated on that psi, we get some number times that psi back again. That's a determinate state, and it will always give that value uh, little Q if we measure it. And an example of this, um, just to get a little more definite, a little less abstract for a second, would be the determinate states of energy, which we've seen so far. Um, like, for example, in the infinite square well, we have the stationary states um, with energies proportional to n squared. Or in the harmonic oscillator, we have de determinate states of energy with energies 1 half h bar omega, 3 halves h bar omega, 5 halves h bar omega, et cetera, from the, from the ground state upward. So these determinate states of energy, if we measure them, the energy again and again, we always get that same value back again. And these are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian uh, H hat. The Hamiltonian is the total energy operator. So that would mean this, this equation Q hat psi is equal to Q psi would become H for the Hamiltonian operator psi is equal to the total energy E psi. And that you may, re you may recognize as a form of the time independent Schrodinger equation. So the time-independent Schrodinger equation is actually a, uh, an eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian operator. So that's kind of an interesting connection to make between, um, between the time-independent Schrodinger equation and eigenvalue equations and 
linear algebra-like concepts. Okay, so we have these Hermitian operators, which all physical observables um, have, and we have eigenvalue equations and eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. So <clears throat> we're interested in eigenfunctions of uh, Hermitian operators. And for, first we'll look at the discrete case. Okay, the discrete case is when the, what we call the spectrum of eigenvalues or the, the collection of all the possible eigenvalues that we can physically get, that's called the spectrum, is discrete, whether it's a finite number or an infinite number. So just to make that more definite in the, uh, in the finite, sorry, in the infinite square well, we have an in, a discrete infinity of energy states labeled by n equal one, two, three, four, five, up to infinity. So that would be a, a infinite, uh, a discrete infinity of states. Uh, so if the spectrum of eigenvalues is discrete, it turns out it can be shown the eigenfunctions are normalizable, which means they're physically realistic and real, realizable. And if they're normalizable, they're in the Hilbert space. Okay, so everything is, is great. This set of eigenfunctions for the, dis, the discrete spectrum of when we have a discrete spectrum of eigenvalues has several key properties. I won't prove them here, but I'll just state them. You can look at the textbook for the proofs. The proofs are fairly compact, um, but I wanna concentrate on the results here. So the eigenvalues, um, when we have a discrete case are all real numbers, okay? They, they are mathematically forced to be real numbers. Um, the second thing is that uh, if we have eigenfunctions with distinct eigenvalues, they are orthogonal. Um, okay, so if we have two eigenfunctions and they have two different eigenvalues, they, the eigenfunctions must be orthogonal. Okay, so an example of this would be the, for example, um, for the, uh, again, going back to the infinite square well, if we have um, two eigenfunctions, one with the, uh, lowest energy state and the second with the first excited state, those that would be distinct eigenvalues. And indeed those two, two functions, the sine of uh, the sine of n pi over n pi x over uh, n pi x over a and the sine of um, two n pi x over a are orthogonal. Okay. So this is very convenient because it leads to the possibility of orthonormality because we get a set of, set of eigenfunctions and eigenvalues that if are well separated, and if two eigenvalues are not the same, the eigenfunctions are associated with them or orthogonal. And as long as we normalize all the eigenfunctions, we'll have an orthonormal set of eigenfunctions, which is very, has great mathematical properties and allows us to do um, lots of interesting and, and useful things. So, um, <clears throat> the third property here is that the set of eigenfunctions is a complete basis for the Hilbert space. So what do I mean by a complete basis? Well, that means that any function in Hilbert space would be expressible as a weighted sum. Um, for example, the, the function f could be written as a weighted sum over all of the eigenfunctions f sub n with a uh, with uh, real coefficients here, so this would be a this would be a discrete infinity, uh, a weighted sum of a discrete over a discrete infinity of of eigenfunctions, and this is saying that any any function in the Hilbert space, any any function which is square integrable, can be written as a linear combination of this set of eigenfunctions um, that we get from the uh, the uh, the eigenvalue, eigenvalue equation. Okay, so that's the, those are the three properties that key properties, the eigenvalues being real numbers, the uh, eigenfunctions with distinct eigenvalues being orthogonal, the set of eigenfunctions being a complete basis. So we have orthonormality and completeness, which have, we've seen those properties for um, the infinite square well and the harmonic oscillator. We've seen that those wave functions we've gotten there um, for, the, for the energy operator, that is the, the energy stationary states are both orthonormal and complete. 
now we see that it's true. It would be true for not just those two potentials, the infinite square well and the harmonic oscillator, but other potentials as well. Um, like a quartic potential instead of a, uh, a, a, a quadratic potential for the harmonic oscillator would also have these properties. Okay, so any potential which has a discrete uh, infinity of uh, eigenvalues is going to have this orthonormality and completeness. So this is very uh, um, casting it as in a very general form and seeing what the <clears throat> mathematical properties of the solutions are. Okay, so moving finally to the continuous case for the Hermitian operator. Um, if the spectrum of eigenvalues are continuous, then uh, the eigenfunctions are, turns out, not normalizable, and so not in the Hilbert space, because the Hilbert space, they, they must have a finite square, uh, square integral. So if they're not normalizable, they're not in Hilbert space. But linear combinations of the eigenfunctions are normalizable. So think here of the free particle states, which we saw um, for the free particle potential. So V equals zero. We had um, uh, uh, exponential states um, in, the, in the position. And uh, they are not normalizable, but we could um, add linear combinations of them together and build up a wave packet. And that wave packet was normalizable, and so it could represent a, a physical uh, particle. Okay, so even though the um, the eigenfunctions themselves coming out of the eigenvalue equation are not normalizable, we can make linear combinations of them to represent uh, physical states. Okay, like we did with the free particle. Okay, so <clears throat> and the key properties which we saw for the discrete case for the um, eigenvalue problem for the Hermitian operator still hold in a fairly useful sense, even, even though we have these functions that are not in the Hilbert space. So it turns out that in this case, mathematically, the eigenvalues, uh, if the spectrum is continuous, the eigenvalues can in principle be complex, but for all physical operators, which we use, they turn out to be real. Okay, so we can, uh, we can count on the uh, eigenvalues being real. And given that the eigenvalues are real, we can show that eigenfunctions with distinct real eigenvalues um, show what's called Dirac orthogonality, okay? So that means that the, um, as opposed to the, uh, uh, as opposed to the inner product being um, either zero or one for the discrete infinity, uh, that we saw in the discrete case, the inner product of uh, f of p prime p, where p prime and p are, are indexing the continuous spectrum of eigenvalues. So they can, these, these take on a continuous range um, of values, p prime and p. So it turns out that it's not equal to zero or one, but equal to the delta function, the Dirac delta function of p minus p prime. So if p is not equal to p prime, this inner product would be zero. If P is equal to P prime, it blows up and it is uh, infinite in the sense of the, um, the delta function. And this mathematical property here uh, for the um, inner product of two uh, eigenfunctions with distinct eigenvalues allows us to, uh, to create an effectively uh, orthonormal set of um, of uh, eigenfunctions. Okay, and finally, um, the set of eigenfunctions is a complete basis for the Hilbert space with any function in Hilbert spa space expressible now as a weighted integral. Before for the discrete case, it was a weighted sum. Now it's a weighted integral because we have a continuous range of uh, spectrum of eigenvalues. So we have to integrate over that spectrum dp, dp of the eigenfunctions f, f p uh, times um, a weight c of p, and if we do if we do that integral, we can sh and uh, and the uh, eigenvalues p are real as they are for physical operators. Then we can show that the um, we can we can build up any function in the Hilbert space 
using this integral. So in that sense, this set of eigenfunctions is complete. Okay, so that's <clears throat> that's kind of the general picture of um, starting to build up a, a, a little more abstract picture that applies to a lot of different systems, notation that isn't specific to one system or one particular quantity. So um, we looked at the, um, we looked at Hilbert space, which is a particular set of uh, square integral functions, which form physically realizable states. We looked at um, Hermitian operators, which are associated with physical quantities. We looked at the eigen, eigenvalue equation and how that related to the um, time independent Schrodinger equation. But we can have eigenvalue equations for other quantities like momentum or position. And we will see that um, in, in future classes. And then finally, we looked at some properties of the uh, eigenvalue equation and the set of eigenfunctions for Hermitian operators for the discrete and the continuous case, seeing that basically we can um, get real eigenvalues in both cases. Um, and we can get orthogonality or th and orthonormality and completeness for both cases. Although we have to be a little bit careful with the continuous case because the eigenfunctions we get are not immediately normalizable. Okay, I hope this has been helpful. Thank you for your attention and I will see you in class.